Hello. Um, just before we start the webinar, just want to do a sound check. Um, if you can hear me clearly, please do click on the hand symbol on the webinar screen. Thank you. Okay, that's that's brilliant. Uh, sorry for the uh, delay. Um, so my name is uh, uh, Tim Sandal, and I'm a committee member from Farmig. And today we're going to have a look at uh, sterility testing um, isolators. Okay, so what we're going to be covering uh, in the webinar today is a little bit about sterility testing concerns, an introduction to isolators, a review of isolated decontamination cycles, biological indicators, key operational decisions, and uh, some information about maintaining isolators. If there is any time for questions, and you have any questions, please can you enter them in the uh, chat function on the webinar. However, if there isn't time to answer your questions during this webinar, then um, we'll either collate the questions or you can email info at farmig.org.uk and we'll do our best to uh, answer the questions uh, by return uh, message. Okay. So one of the major concerns with the sterility test, especially when high value products are handled, is the risk of false positives. And this can lead to expensive and lengthy failure investigations. And here, proving a false positive is extremely difficult. And therefore, the worst case outcome is batch rejection. A false positive, can be described as a contaminating microorganism that has been transferred into the test media through cross-contamination by personnel or from the test environment. And this contrasts to microbial contamination being present in the product under the test. Where the sterility test is conducted within a conventional clean room, the risk of cross-contamination is arguably higher than if the test was conducted within an isolator. Now with the advent of isolator technology, it has, in theory, lowered the incidence of false positives. However, isolators themselves are not without their operational and qualification issues. And it's the operation and qualification of the isolator that is going to form the core part of this webinar. Okay, so we're going to have a look at the advantages of isolators for sterility testing and then lead into some of the operational issues that spring from it. Okay, so just to uh, get a baseline, what is an isolator? Well, an isolator is simply an arrangement of physical barriers that are integrated so the workspace, the enclosed environment, is sealed from the outside environment. In terms of advantages, isolators provide a testing environment that is free from contamination. And this is achieved through routine sanitization using a validated cycle. And this can be confirmed by physical checks and through monitoring of the environment. Isolators enable the isolation between the operator and the activity. Isolators have doors to provide access to the equipment inside the isolator. Isolators have glove ports situated in such a way to allow the tester to access the necessary machinery and also to handle the finished product. Isolators also have a mechanism by which materials can be sanitized and then securely placed within the isolator. This can be through the use of transfer isolators, or perhaps more commonly these days, through the use of a rapid gassing port. 
Now some users elect to load all materials into a main isolator and then run a full sanitization cycle or they elect to use a gassing port. However that works, the design principle is to provide an in-feed opening to introduce materials and product into the core isolator system. Isolators also need to have a means of exit. Uh, it can be the same way as entry, but a means of allowing finished product and test materials to exit from the isolator system. To maintain the barrier with the external environment, isolators consist of either a flexible film for the outer wall, or they have a solid wall envelope. With the exception of handling certain medicinal products, such as cytotoxic drugs, isolators used for the sterility test when operative are at a positive pressure relative to the room. And they have high efficiency particulate air, or HEPA, filtered airflow. The pressure level of the isolators is normally monitored by pressure alarms on the taking of readings. The maintenance of isolators is important, especially in ensuring the minimization of leakage, where leakage of air could lead to the ingress of air from a less clean surrounding room environment into the isolator. So the maintenance of isolator integrity and filter efficiency is of the utmost importance. Isolators are normally tested biannually every six months for HEPA filter leaks, air velocity, particle counts, induction leak tests, and differential pressure. And importantly, each one of these parameters must fall within predefined set of ranges. A further key advantage with isolators is that they can be automatically decontaminated. And with isolators, the most common method of sanitization is hydrogen peroxide vapor. However, peracetic acid or chlorine can also be used. And there are some models in development that are using other means of decontamination, such as plasma gases. But it remains that hydrogen peroxide is the most common sanitization agent you'll come across. Now, importantly, isolators are said to disinfect or to sanitize rather than to sterilize. And this is because absolute sterility cannot be demonstrated. So an isolator can't be proven to sterilize the way that an autoclave could. And this is because the sanitization agent has no penetrative ability. Sanitization in this context though can be quantified and it describes the reduction of a number of microorganisms within the clean environment as demonstrated through the use of biological indicators in validation studies for different isolator cycles. And we'll come back to biological indicators a little bit later. So further with biocontamination, I'm taking hydrogen peroxide as the most common agent. Hydrogen peroxide vapor disinfection employs a free radical reaction mechanism to facilitate the microbiocidal action. And it is very difficult for microorganisms to develop resistance to such a free radical attack. The vapor is typically generated by flash evaporation from 30% weight by volume of liquid hydrogen peroxide. 30% or 35% are the most typical concentrations used. And this is delivered into the isolator system via a rotating nozzle. The mechanism of, of gas distribution as the gas to liquid phase change process occurs is called 
microcondensation. A microcondensation formation is a simple and efficient way of delivering the hydrogen peroxide agent to all exposed surfaces. An advantage of hydrogen peroxide is that it always decomposes, or what some chemists might call disproportionates, exothermically into water and into oxygen in a gaseous form. Okay, so how do we qualify an isolator for sterility testing? And we're going to have a look here at a case study. So this presentation will go on to examine the important operational criteria for an isolator used for sterility testing. To contextualize the operational criteria, the presentation will also address aspects of validation and the maintenance program. And this centers around an isolator that consisted of two solid wall positive pressure isolators, what are sometimes referred to as type one isolators. And they were linked by a rapid gassing port. And the gassing port and the isolators are attached to a gas generator. And although other isolator systems will be different, the aim of this presentation is to discuss general requirements and to provide some best practice guidance. So here are some photographs of the isolator system that's being discussed. So you can see on the right hand side, there are two solid wall isolators and in between them is a rapid gassing port. And then to the extreme uh, right of the image is the gas generator. The image to the left is just a photograph of a technician undertaking a sterility test within this environment. So what we're gonna have a look at first is isolated decontamination cycles. And it's important to present these steps and to understand exactly what's happening with the decontamination um, requirements because that affects both the validation of the isolator and also the operational requirements of the isolator. So for the operation of an isolator for sterility testing, a number of steps need to be followed. Now the first one, step one, is what's called a pre-cycle disinfection. And this is prior to the product items and other material that is not sterilized and perhaps contained within double wrapping, such as a test kit, being loaded into the isolator or gassing port. Now here, some users elect to wipe down items with 70% isopropyl alcohol using a low particulate wipe and observing the required contact time for the alcohol. Now, it could be argued that such a step is not necessary given the demonstrable kill achieved from biological indicators. However, some regulatory agencies have asked for this step to be included as a form of transfer disinfection. So that's the reason that I'm presenting it here. It is optional, but it is a topic that has come from um, MHRA. A rationale for inclusion of this step is that gaseous disinfection requires a pre-cleaning step and surface gaseous disinfection requires a starting condition wherein a surface is visibly clean of soiling. Now, contamination or soiling may occlude microorganisms from the sanitization process. And this could present a biocontamination risk. And that's the reason why some elect to include a pre-wiping step for the loading of items that are not themselves um, sterile. 
but I do have to emphasize that this is an optional step. Okay, so step two is the gassing port and the disinfection cycles. Now, a gassing port is a chamber connected to an isolator or isolators via interlocking doors. And this can be open to the room environment for loading without compromising the integrity of the isolators themselves. The gassing port is designed to sanitize the different sterility test loads in a faster time than it would be possible if loads were placed inside a primary isolator, which is why it has the advantage of time. Gassing port is connected to a gas generator. The function of the gas generator is to heat the hydrogen peroxide to produce a vapor and to provide generated vapor to the port. The function of the port is to actually distribute the vapor via a distribution nozzle. The function of this distribution no nozzle, which rotates, is to prevent hot spots arising from an uneven distribution of the gas. The dosage of the hydrogen peroxide is controlled by the user by placing the chemical into the gas generator of the right concentration. And the generator provides a controlled release of the chemical. When loading an isolator or port, the presentation of surfaces to the sanitization process is extremely important. Material loads often rely on point contact support, such as the use of wire racking or hangers. And this is necessary to assure complete exposure to the disinfection agent. A typical load will consist of final product samples, a sterility test kit, culture media for the test, rinsing fluids, and environmental monitoring test plates, all of the necessary elements to conduct the sterility test. Right, so with step three, looking at the actual sanitization cycle. So I said earlier, the sanitization process occurs by using an aqueous solution of hydrogen peroxide, and that's evaporated in such a way as to produce the same weight ratio in the vapor phase as in the source liquid. This can either be 30 or 35% weight by weight of hydrogen peroxide. This vapor is transported into the chamber to be biocontaminated in a heated carrier gas. And this is initially sterile compressed air. Vapors are circulated around the chamber and then through a catalyzing filter at the end of sanitization in order to break down the hydrogen peroxide. The sanitization stage functions within the chamber by depositing an even layer of hydrogen peroxide over all surfaces. And this was the uh, technique of microcondensation that I described earlier. There is a debate in the industry over the microcondensation process about whether it's a wet or a dry process. And different manufacturers offer either what they call a wet or a dry process. But this is centered on rival technologies and doesn't really affect the the core optimal kill conditions. Because however that is generated, what matters is that a dew point is reached or a hold time or a contact time. And achieving this dew point is based on a certain target volume of gas. And this is sensitive to the starting temperature, the relative humidity conditions, the load used, the isolated surface temperature, and the subsequent amount of vapor injected into the target volume. And these are important for when we come to look at operational parameters later. These are all key measurements that need to be checked to verify that the isolator has indeed decontaminated in the way that it's expected to be decontaminated. Condensation formation at saturated vapor conditions past the dew point is the mechanism that delivers the hydrogen peroxide molecules to all the exposed surfaces. 
And as this is physical chemistry, there are physical parameters to control. So isolator and gassing port cycle times should be established and examined for each operation. And the parameters should be checked for every operation. Now carrying on with the sanitization cycle, there are four key stages to ensure that an optimal hydrogen peroxide vapor disinfection process has been undertaken. First is vaporization of liquid to small molecule gas phase in order to deliver the target volume. Second is the development of the gas concentration in the target environment to achieve saturated vapor conditions past the dew point and the eventual transition to the liquid phase. Third, at saturated vapor conditions, the gas concentration can hold no more molecules and thus the process of condensation formation and disinfection agent surface deposition starts. And finally, there's the re-evaporation of the surface condensate and the removal of the residual gas to the target endpoint concentration. So that's fine in theory. What does that mean in practice? Well, the sanitization cycle operates through the following steps. So first of all, the generator initially dehumidifies the ambient air, a process that's sometimes called conditioning. Here, the initial temperature and relative humidity is optimized before vapor injection. Hot, dry air is exchanged within the target environment to achieve the required starting humidity conditions. The generator then produces hydrogen peroxide vapor by passing aqueous hydrogen peroxide over a vaporizer. The gas distribution is an active process controlled through a nozzle for a predetermined volume of hydrogen peroxide. During validation, an expected time range for the gassing or dosage phase is determined, and that all links to the gassing pump speed. So cycle times for routine operations for everyday sterility testing must fall within this range. Vapor is then circulated at a programmed concentration in the air and held for a set period of time. So this is the dwell time, which I was referring to. The dwell time is optimized to maintain microcondensation conditions throughout the complete dwell phase for an assured disinfectant contact time. Finally, after the hydrogen peroxide vapor is circulated in the enclosed space for a predefined period of time, it is circulated and broken down into water and oxygen using a catalytic converter until concentrations of hydrogen peroxide vapor fall to a safe level. And certainly within the UK, the health and safety executive has determined that this safe level is one part per million. So less than one part per million is within the safe occupational exposure level. And it means it's safe for people to be in the vicinity. So for the isolator cycle, the primary process variables that need to be controlled, so for both validation and for routine use, are the starting relative humidity, the surface and environmental temperatures, the gas distribution, so you're ensuring there's a homogeneous deposition of vapor and resulting surface condensate, the amount of evaporated hydrogen peroxide solution must be dosed into a target volume, which is expressed in terms of grams per minute. And that's designed to reach saturated vapor conditions and to provide a sufficient monolayer of the disinfectant. There's also the surface area for the condensate distribution, together with the amount of surface absorbency. And each one of these process variables needs to be controlled. And we'll discuss some of those um, in terms of more practical examples shortly. So the purposes of this section 
was to discuss the um, cycle physics and chemistry, but how in practice are isolator cycles validated? Well, gassing cycles are validated and developed using biological indicators. And these are indicators using the same organism as would be used for moist heat sterilization. And that's spores of Geobacillus sterothermophilus. And these spores are dried onto stainless steel discs. Now it's important that this carrier is inert and it promotes the even dispersion of the spore suspension. And it must have a limited effect on the resistance of the microorganism. Now these metal discs are typically placed in Tyvex pouches or some other type of polyethylene fibre. And this creates the biological indicator used to validate the gassing cycle. It's important that the microorganism has the ability, should it survive or as verified through a positive control, to germinate under defined conditions in a standard culture medium. And it is of low pathogenicity to people. The geobacillus used should be traceable to the American type culture collection, that's the ATCC. And typically, as pharmacopoeia require, this is either strains ATCC 7953 or ATCC 12980. The requirement is also that the biological indicator must demonstrate adequate sanitization of the isolator through achieving a six log reduction. So for this, a minimum population of greater than five times 10 to five is the initial number. Typically, the ones that are purchased have populations above 10 to the power of six. Scientific data indicates that there's a relationship between kill time and surface temperature, and that faster kills are seen nearer the dew point of the gassing vapor. It's also similar in terms of kill as with an autoclave in that the destruction of the microorganisms follows a logarithmic pattern. Hydrogen peroxide, as I said before, is a surface disinfectant. Therefore, it's important that the biological indicators are presented to ensure maximum surface area exposure. Here, the envelope needs to be folded back, so the biological indicator is not lying flat on a surface. So you may need to use something like captain tape to secure the indicator. After exposure of each biological indicator, the disc should be transferred into a medium like triptone soya broth or soybean casein digest medium and incubated at 55 to 60 degrees because this is a thermophilic organism for a minimum of seven days. Some companies elect to incubate for longer on the basis that the incubation time needs to be sufficient to recover any stressed or sublethally damaged organisms. However, that needs to be factored in with how much downtime you wish to have with the isolator. Importantly, positive and negative controls need to be performed with each cycle. Now, with developing load patterns, this is an important part of the operational qualification and performance qualification stages. So in the case of this case study, different sterility test load combinations were mapped out. These were then evaluated to look at the smallest and largest, largest configurations. And this is by assessing the different load types and assessed by calculating the surface area and by an assessment of the degree of absorbent material in the load. Once, once assessed, the worst case, maximum load, was evaluated against biological indicators using different cycle parameters. The cycle that achieved total biological indicator kill was chosen as the base cycle, 
And that was then performed on three occasions. From the satisfactory outcomes of the maximum load validation, it was reasoned that all intermediate loads would also be satisfactory based on the load of the largest surface area being the worst case. And also through demonstrated reproducibility and repeatability based on successive validation cycles. The routine cycle parameters are also then established by incorporating an overkill for the gassing agent volume and dwell time to ensure that a robust cycle is in place. So this is again not dissimilar to the strategy that might be undertaken for an autoclave. A matrix approach is adopted. Worst case load is determined by surface area or mass. The point of kill is found and then an extended or overkill cycle is run. During the performance qualification with this isolator, each different load type was assessed using biological indicators and this led to the establishment of the routine um, cycle. Further with developing load patterns, um, it's good practice to either use duplicate or perhaps even triplicate indicators at each location. And this is due to the theoretical and sometimes borne out in practice risk of so-called rogue biological indicators. Now the manufacture of biological indicators is a very imprecise task. It's akin to bucket chemistry. And it's not impossible for multiple layers of spores, other organisms or general debris to also peer onto the carrier. So it could lead to some spores not being exposed to the surface disinfectant, thereby leading to a false positive result. So in this case study, which used duplicate biological indicators, the following strategy was adopted. If both duplicates indicated no growth, the test was deemed to have passed. If both duplicates indicated growth, the test was deemed to have failed. And the cycle parameters will require re-reviewing and probably extending. If one duplicate indicated growth and the other no growth, then that would lead to an outer specification investigation. It then led to a repeat in triplicate. And if all three triplicates passed, then this cycle was deemed to be acceptable. Importantly, once load patterns become established, they must become the standard load patterns and no significant changes should take place without requalification. So again, the kind of rule that would apply to an autoclave um, cycle. An important consideration is the frequency of isolated load requalification. And when undertaken, the types of load patterns required. As a minimum, this is ordinarily the largest size for each load type. Requalification is undertaken to verify that the isolator system and gassing port continue to operate as expected. That is to demonstrate that the gassing system continues to kill a known population of resistant spores, a kill or no kill test. In this particular case study, a decision was taken to requalify the entire isolator system using biological indicators on an annual basis. Okay, so we've covered the theory of isolated decontamination and we've looked at the approach for validation. We're now going to have a look at some other key operational decisions associated with running a sterility testing isolator. So let's begin with the frequency of sanitization of the isolators. So the frequency of sanitization of the entire isolator system needs to be established. And this is a separate activity to the gassing of each load. Because remember what I said earlier, the isolators are isolated um, from the gassing port and they're only exposed to the gassing port after the gassing port itself has run through a decontamination cycle. 
So the question here is, how often should the core isolators be decontaminated? So this was based on a risk assessment, and here environmental monitoring data fed into that risk assessment. And the outcome was to sanitize the two isolators uh, once per week. And the purpose here was to minimize the risk of microorganisms surviving within the core isolator. Over time, this established frequency can be reviewed and increased or even decreased if necessary. Circumstances that might trigger this could include environmental monitoring data from sterility testing indicating an upward trend or even a sterility test failure itself. Another factor to consider is how to approach cleaning and disinfection because there will be occasions when the inside of the isolator uh, needs to be clean and disinfected. So this may include a spillage incident. For this, the cleaning and disinfection agents should be carefully selected. For cleaning, the detergent selected should be sterile and ideally neutral, because that way any residues are less likely to affect or react with the disinfectant. The disinfectant of choice, given that most isolators are constructed from stainless steel, would be something like 70% IPA. And this is because other disinfectants could damage the stainless steel in the chamber, causing scratching or rouging. And certainly chlorine-based disinfectants um, could do so. Another risk with chlorine disinfectants, so they're not completely removed, and then hydrogen peroxide vapor cycle is run, then a reaction will occur, leading to the loss of the outer layer of the stainless steel. So what if a more uh, stronger disinfectant is required, like a sporocyte, then it's very, very important that any residues are removed prior to the next sanitization cycle. Another factor to consider is the frequency of glove changes. Now, isolated gloves are prone to leakage, and it's generally recognized that the glove represents the weakest point with any isolator system. Some users elect to test all gloves for leakage before and after each test. This is only possible if there's a good and effective glove leak testing device available. Some are available that are unreliable. So this needs to be factored into the validation. Where leak testing is difficult to perform, some users adopt a policy to change the gloves for every batch. Some might choose to do it every week or some other frequency. This could be supported by a visual inspection before and after each test, or a simple uh, intrusion test at the end of use, simply filling the glove up with water and seeing if water dribbles out. Other data that could support would also be uh, finger plate monitoring, but it has to be recognized that uh, environmental monitoring is a relative weak detection system against other forms of environmental control. It's also important to perform environmental monitoring with each sterility test, and this should happen every time. And the typical environmental monitoring samples taken are air samples, using a volumetric sampler, saddle plates, and then post-test finger plates, swabs, or contact plates. The action level would be to EUGMP grade A, equivalent to ISO 14644 class five, which would be one colony forming unit. Some uh, users elect to perform particle counting uh, in, the, in the unoccupied state, maybe once a week. Uh, there's no requirements to perform particle counting during a sterility test, and given most sterility test practices, that would be very difficult to achieve um, a situation without particle excursions. Environmental monitoring data should be used to show the level of contamination inside the isolator um, is in control, and such data is very useful should a sterility test failure ever occur. 
It's also important that the culture media used should be subject to inhibition studies to determine that the hydrogen peroxide does not have an in inhibitory effect on the growth promotion properties of the culture medium. In most cases, the uh, barrier packaging is the main way to protect that, but it is possible to add neutralizers to agar should um, there be a hole in a pack or pack bag or anything like that. The room in which the isolated system is housed should also be subject to environmental um, monitoring. And on the subject of the isolator housing room, many isolators are held within a clean room. And uh, this is typically a grade D, but it could be grade C. Where a clean room is used, the clean room will have to meet various operational parameters. And these include a positive pressure differential to the room to the outside, uh, have a controlled temperature because if the temperature isn't in control, this could affect the isolated gassing parameters. In this particular study proposal, the temperature was around 21 degrees. Similarly, humidity control is important. The room would need to have high efficiency particulate air filters with a good efficiency rating, such as H13 or H14 to, uh, to EN1822 standard. Uh, there should be controlled air change rates and there should be routine environment monitoring and particle counting within the room as well. Okay, so we're granted to put in more and more information together. Now what needs to be considered for maintaining sterility testing isolators? So what are some of the good practice things to take account of? So in order for an isolator function as is required, a number of physical attributes and tests must be performed and measured at periodic intervals. The types of parameters to measure and the appropriate limits to be applied and the frequencies will vary according to different isolators. The important factor is they need to be defined up front and justified. And many of them are critical because they will be used to verify that the gassing cycle was satisfactory and also be used to assess the validity of the sterility tests. So some key parameters that we'll have a look at include the volume of hydrogen peroxide used, the gas concentration alert level, alarm statuses during cycles, gas injection phase time, and humidity at the start of gassing. It's also important that some of these parameters are trended to determine whether the gassing system is operating as expected, and this is, gives an early indicator if something is in fact um, going wrong. So looking at some of these parameters further, with gas injection temperature, um, in this particular case study, the alarm range was 41 to 50 degrees, and this is something determined during the validation. But if the, uh, this temperature is out, then it will affect the effectiveness of, of kill. Also important is the temperature inside gassing ports. Uh, so again, in this case study, this was 15 to 30 degrees. And this is important as part of the conditioning phase. And the risk of air temperature being affected by cold external air upon the isolator. Humidity, in this case study, was 50 to 70% relative humidity. And this is important because the gassing port is designed to condition the air prior to it passing through the isolator system or from the commencement of gassing. So again, if this is wrong, then uh, you're not going to get that micro condensation kill effect. Also important is the gassing time. Time is an important parameter because if the time falls outside the set range, then the gassing cycle will probably be ineffective. Problems with gassing time may indicate that the peristaltic pump heads, for example, need changing. The cycle parameters of peroxide injection rates and phase time should be developed uh, during the validation. Then for routine operation, gassing time should not fall outside the limit set. To do so would create a risk that a blockage in relation to pump delivery 
has occurred. All that, the incorrect volume of hydrogen peroxide has been used. In such an event, then that cycle will be rejected and investigated. And again, gassing dwell time is set during the gas the cycle development phase, and it's a very, very important uh, measure to, to assess for every time the isolator is decontaminated. With uh, pressure, it's important there's positive pressure relative to the isolator room, so the isolator to the room, and this is required to prevent the ingress of contamination from the outside environment. The minimum specification would be something like 20 pascals, and this would be sufficient to prevent an occurrence happening and have a degree of a safety margin. There also perhaps needs to be a maximum in order to um, stop the isolator from overpressurizing it and uh, leading to structural damage or making it difficult for the operator to actually get their hands into the gloves. It's also important to uh, leak rate test an isolator. Uh, and this is a test that um, either happens automatically before every cycle is run or is something that needs to be done manually at periodic intervals. This is often uh, from a high starting pressure, such as 50 pascals. And then there's a time sequence and monitoring looking at the degree of leakage over a 90 second period of time. And the uh, requirement in ISO 14644 part seven, which refers to isolators, is that going from 150 over 90 seconds, the pressure must not fall by more than 25 pascals in order for the test to pass. Air control is also important. So here we have the requirement for HEPA filters inside the isolator. And here, uh, EN1822H14 standard HEPA filters would be required. In terms of uh, air direction, although laminarity is not required for a sterility testing isolator, there's a theoretical argument that the airflow should at least demonstrate it could remove contamination away from the critical test area. The air speed, the air velocity, should be as per any other grade A device, which is 0.45 meters per second um, at the working height uh, within 20% of the 0.45. There should also be control of air change rates, which is necessary for the dilution and removal of any potential contaminants from the isolator environment. And there should also be particle control with the particles meeting the standard grade A limits, which are 3,520 for 0.5 micron and uh, no more than 20 counts for a 5 micron. Okay, so we're drawing this presentation to an end. And uh, what we've looked at are the is, is a definition of isolators and uh, some of the uh, key things to consider. So the study is focused on uh, the development of isolator cycles and reference has been made to um, validation parameters and to critical physical parameters that require monitoring for routine sanitization cycles. So we've seen how um, validation and development link to routine operation. And this is about ensuring the isolator remains free from contamination. And given that there are different isolator systems available, not every parameter that I've described will be applicable to each system. However, most of the processes and parameters will be of relevance. And you should really be hopefully using some of the information I've presented so you can benchmark against your own systems um, in order to um, develop a rationale and a process for ensuring that testing um, has been undertaken. So to support this presentation, um, there is a, um, a, a paper that I wrote, um, which is called Validation Operation of the Sterility Testing Isolator, uh, which contains more information. Uh, Farmigar, happy to send you a copy of this paper. 
what you need to do is to either uh, contact um, the Farmig office, uh, which is uh, info at farmig.org.uk, um, and we will be happy to um, send you an electronic copy of that document. So in summary, uh, we've looked at sterility testing concerns, an introduction to isolators, isolated decontamination cycles, factors around biological indicators, the validation of isolator cycles, key operation decisions, and some best practices around maintaining isolators. So on behalf of Farmig, we sincerely hope that you've uh, enjoyed this presentation and um, we're happy to answer any, any questions that um, you might have and uh, we'll just go to our question uh, box and we've got a few coming in. So one of the questions is, can the temperature of the room of the isolator situated in affect the microcondensation of the sanitization within the isolator? Um, the answer is yes, according to uh, most isolator um, manufacturers. There is normally a fairly wide range over this, um, but in general, it's good practice to have temperature control of, of, of a clean room because it will start to become uncomfortable for operators as well. But um, normally, if the room is, say, between um, 18 and 25 degrees, that should not affect the um, isolator um, cycle. And, um, but that is something to ensure you've got in place for the validation. So ensure the room is controlled and then execute the um, validation. Okay, and we have a, uh, another question coming in. And this question is, when determining load patterns for routine testing, is it acceptable just to qualify the maximum and minimum loads? Uh, so my, uh, my, my thoughts are, yes, certainly I think it is. It's just that the matrix approach is certainly um, accepted by many regulators, including uh, certainly by FDA. And I think with MHRA, um, a rationale could be put together. And this is a common uh, approach for um, autoclaves as well. Um, it's just um, defining maximum and where the maximum is on um, mass or by surface area or a combination of both. And you also just need to bear in mind if there's any um, odd shaped items um, that might affect um, gas distribution to accommodate for those, because you capture all of those and then you put your biological indicators in the right places, the hardest points to kill then um, to me that's a perfectly acceptable uh, practice to use. Okay, um, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, we'll endeavour to answer the other questions by, um, by email. Um, so Farmig do hope that this uh, webinar has been of interest. Um, we are keen to continue to uh, produce as many um, webinars as, as there is demand for. So if you have a subject that you'd like a webinar to be held for, again, please email info at farmig.org.uk and uh, we will endeavour to put on uh, a, a webinar for you. Um, also, uh, wish to draw your attention to um, some of uh, Farmig's uh, new publications that have come out. And in relation to um, isolators, we now have a, a clean room guide uh, which discusses um, how to um, assess and qualify a commission a clean room, including isolators. And also in connection to the um, subjects of sanitization, if you haven't seen Farming's new electronic learning platform, um, the opening set of modules are all about cleaning and disinfection and there's uh, a nice video and some information on the main Farmig web page. So it remains for me to say thank you for your attention, uh, goodbye and um, enjoy the rest of your day and Farmig will be back with you soon 
with another webinar uh, through notified through our email bulletin system. So thank you and goodbye.